You may be surprised at what God says are good gifts, even better, perfect gifts. Let's talk about it. Today we're talking about good gifts, right? Good gifts. We worship a God who gives good gifts to his children. He actually gives, and he even tells us in Scripture, he gives gifts to even those who are opposed to him. He says the rain falls on the just and the unjust. He provides food for all. And yet, there is much, much more that he does for his children. That's what we're talking about today. We're going to be in the book of James in verses 16 through 18. Now, I want to review a little bit with you. Last week, we talked about the example of Israel and how we were told not to follow that example. That was from 1 Corinthians 10. Israel set a terrible example. If you remember, of all the ones who left Egypt, the only ones who made it into the promised land were Caleb and Gideon and the kids. Everybody else died in the wilderness because of their rebellion. So Paul says, don't copy them. Flee the evil that they sought. Glorify God in how you live. They weren't willing to trust God. You know, every time they turned around, they would see something miraculous, right? And we would think, well, if we saw the Red Sea parted, oh, how could I ever forget that? Trust me, humans forget. We see God do mighty things in our lives, and then we forget it. That's what Israel did. And even as we read in James, as they chose to refuse God's promises and rebel against his guidance, they followed the pattern that we see James talking about in 14 and 15. So if you're not there already, go ahead and turn to James chapter 1. <clears throat> and you'll see there in 14 and 15, but each person is tempted when he was lured and enticed by his own desire. His own desire. Right? Give me the candy. Give me the, the stuff of life that I think is so good for me, that really can rot my teeth and rot my soul. And then it says in 15, then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Oof. They bought into the lies of Egypt, and they followed the desires of their own heart, even when they knew it was not what God wanted for them, and the lies of Satan to make their decisions. And functionally, what they told God was, hey, psh, my way or the highway, mister? You're going to do it our way. But more simply, I am God, and I'll do what I want to do. And that's the struggle that humans have always had. Sinful desires, it's easy for us to glom onto something. Even stuff that is good initially can be bad, just like eating too much candy, like we talked about with the kids. But anything like that that leads us away from God and what God wants for us can be a bad thing. And you know, this picture that we see of Israel and how they were in the wilderness is a picture or a type of where we are in a world that wants us to be destroyed. Remember what the enemy does. He wanders around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy, and he does that by lying all the time. We see in the Israel the same problems we face. They're different in some ways, but in our heads they're very, very similar. And we also see evil personified in the picture that James gives us, that we go from being enticed and getting over into temptation to do things that aren't healthy for us and are opposed to God, and ultimately we bring about sin. That's a warning. Here's one commentator who wrote this. He says, when we indulge our sinful desires, sin becomes a pattern and eventually a life-dominating force. Unchecked, sin brings death as the Exodus generation sadly learn. You know, any of us who have had addictive behaviors know how true this is, but here's the truth. Everybody has addictive behaviors. Some of those behaviors are just more socially acceptable than others. And then there's this worst case scenario for testing. We talked about testing last time too, and the time before, that God is testing us through the trials of life. We've got two cases. The best case scenario is that we see and we learn through the trials that we face that we repent for our part in rebelling against God, that God gives us forgiveness and we have life. And not just life here, but life abundant and eternal. That's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is this, that we rebel and we continue to rebel and we continue to reject and we go, God, don't want a part of you, I am God, I'll take my own route. Well, my own route leads to death, not just here, but eternally. Those are the choices we have, the best case and the worst case. So with that review, let's go ahead and take a look at James chapter 1. 
and starting verse 16. <clears throat> Do not be deceived, my brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation or of his creatures. So when James says every good and perfect gift is from above, what's interesting here is he's using two different terms. Again, every time I read the Bible, I learn something new. James is probably a book I've read more than any other book in the Bible, and I never paid attention to this before. These words here, the different gifts, are very different. Every good gift in this context is a physical gift. And when it says every perfect gift, you can actually read every perfected gift. It's talking about things that come over time and that take effort, typically. It takes refining, it takes aging, like maturity, learning wisdom, you know, going through the trials of life is actually a process of maturation that has its own gift. And we read about that in Proverbs and elsewhere. And like the gifts we showed the kids, sure, the candy is fun for a moment. It's got more negative than positive consequences. The batteries or the toothbrush should be nice. They have longer term benefits, but the Bible and Christ have eternal benefits. And so, what is the best gift? What is the gift that takes maturation? Plus, this gift of the perfect gift that we're reading about actually is something that looks towards what we've been reading in chapter 1. Consider all joy, my brethren, when you face various trials. Trials, believe it or not, can be in that process. They can bring about gifts or they're part of the ultimate gift because of that maturation. And that's pretty amazing because it goes so counter to what we think and what we feel and what the world tells us, right? But there are perfect gifts that take time to complete. And if you've ever made anything of consequence, you know that some of the beautiful artwork or tapestries or quilts or furniture or whatever you build, the really beautiful stuff, the really amazing stuff, takes time, it takes effort, right? It's true in life, too. And that's what God is telling us here. And for those who are in Christ, those perfect gifts are eternal gifts to life and life eternal, like we were reading about when we read in James 1.12. We're told to be thankful for all these gifts, which is counter to what we think, but it's like a lot of things in life. When you get to the end of a process and you go, wow, like having a baby. Most women don't report, all I thought about was how bad it was as soon as I had my baby. No, what they had was a baby, and that's what they focused on. It was the result, not the process. And although we may have things we look back in the process and enjoy, many times it's not the digging out of some groove of wood. It's not sanding some rough edge of wood or whatever project you're working on. It's the ultimate finished result that we can stand back and go, wow, that's great. And every once in a while you get to join somebody else's project, like out at the Randstrom's place, fill in the woodshed, right? You look back and the woodshed's full and you go, hey, that's okay, that's good. But it took some time to get there. You had to step on a, on a, you know, a log and roll up and turn your knee and all the other things you do to get in that process. Well, I did. You didn't, maybe. But, the, uh, but it's, it's, it's that kind of thing that we work towards and we see come to fruition. And it comes, as we're looking here, from the Father of Lights, which is an interesting term. When we look at the Bible, where do we see the Father of Lights first? In Genesis, in the creation process. In Genesis 1, 3 through 5, where God is making the light, and then there's dark, he makes the stars, and the moon, and the sun. And so we can all agree on that. In the Jewish context, what's interesting is that many look to the term ruach, which is God working in light, and as a wind. It's actually used in the Old Testament where life is breathed into Adam as wind, and that's where we most often see it. But it's also sometimes used as light, which is kind of interesting because what do we see when God establishes the new covenant after Jesus has ascended? We see in Acts chapter 2 a wind come through where the apostles and, and followers of Christ are, 
uh, a wind that they know isn't a physical wind, and then flames of light on their heads. That's the Ruach. That's looking back to what God has promised. As he does so often throughout Scripture, he is at work. And then they sometimes point to God's presence with us, too. The Shekinah glory was something that covered Moses' face after he had had an encounter with God. Or the Shekinah, which is a root word for that, which was around the Ark of the Covenant, the power and presence of God. All of that kind of goes into what we're talking about here. There's the Father of Lights who's engaged in our lives. We've had the Holy Spirit within us. And there is evidence of that being worked out. God's presence in us. It's a pretty remarkable thing. And, <clears throat> you know, it's just, just so you remember, right? Um, when we read in Scripture, we're reminded of this a lot too, but we don't often apply it to ourselves. We're not really thinking about it. If we look, for example, at Acts 2.38, for example, in that same chapter where the Holy Spirit comes down on the believers at the time. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about, hey, there's a process of connecting with God. John writes about it in 1417. In fact, this is Jesus speaking. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, the Holy Spirit, to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And then Paul will write in Romans 8, 9, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. That seal that we talked about in the song earlier, we are sealed in Christ. So, a lot of people do a lot of things when they talk about this. The lesser lights and the greater lights. God being the greater light, the one who is always manifesting light. He is light. Versus us. We're lesser lights, just like the stars and the moon. You know, we wane, we wax, or we sometimes are darker or lighter, right? We could get into a lot of that. But really, the point is that God is our Father from above. He makes the lights. He makes life. He does all of this, and he gives gifts to us, physical, immediate gifts, as well as long-term, permanent gifts. But like gifts, you don't always have to accept a gift. You can reject God's gifts. And so we'll talk about some of that as we go along, too. But even trials can be good gifts. So there's that free will versus God's will, right? We have a choice. God's will for us is that we know him, that we know his love, that we follow him, that we grow in him. But he says, you know what, I don't want robots. You can make a choice. You can choose what you want to do. And for some, many perhaps, that is, look, I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to do my own thing. You know, when we're busy being our own God, the temptations or the trials of life that we read about earlier are seen as just obstacles to us getting what we want. But the trials of life when we're in Christ, when we are looking at the lens that God has provided, are actually opportunities to grow in God. It sounds strange to our worldly head, but it's true. One writer wrote this, tests stand among God's gifts, not his curses. But if our sinfulness leads us to fail life's tests, how can we escape our failures? There's an answer to that in 17 and 18. We'll read that again. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he, we have hope in him because of that. Verse 18. Of his own will he, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. God is the one who made a way for us to know him, to follow him, and in that he provided an escape. That's Jesus, accepting Christ as Savior. And that's all part of God's generosity. You know, God gives the just and the unjust morning and night, opportunity to sleep and opportunity to be awake, food, and all those kind of basic things. But he gives so much more to those who are his, there are always impressive gifts out there that he offers. 
And the thing is, God isn't telling us that you've got to work harder, faster, better, be more beautiful, be smarter. What he's saying is, trust in me. Rely in me. I know you're weak. But I love you anyway. I know you'll fail. But I love you anyway. It's okay. You're growing. And when you accept Christ as Savior, that Holy Spirit in you transforms you. Right? If you're a true believer, where there's life, there's hope. As a follower of Christ, God offers forgiveness of sin made possible because of Jesus' sacrifice. And James reminds us of this in chapter 2, which we haven't got to yet, 2.13. He says, mercy triumphs over judgment. God is merciful and he's gracious. He forgives us when we ask for forgiveness. And he also looks at our condition and provides ways for us to escape. Now what about unbelievers? Because that's a question too. Because that's that difference between free will. Are we following God's leading and accepting Christ as Savior? Are we rejecting God's leading and going, no, 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 I'm going to do my own thing. Well, there's plenty of opportunity for those who are going through trials, who have rejected God, to end up flat on their backs, looking up. And that's a great time to go, wow, my plans didn't work. I'm not a great God. But wait, oh, hey, there you are. You know, just like the atheist I mentioned last week who said, when I prayed as a child for God to save my mother and he died and she died, I hated God then and I hate him still. Now, this is an atheist who said God doesn't exist, right? We have these issues that we've got to work through. All of us have been there to some degree. But we can be born again by accepting Christ, whether we do it through a more direct and quicker route or whether we take the route of rejecting, rejecting, and being basically beat down by our own plans, we can see the new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Um, talking about the transformation of into a new creation of those who are in Christ Jesus. And then we can also, it's made possible because of the Holy Spirit working in us, like we read about in Titus 3, 5. The birth is possible through God's word of truth, as we read in verse 18. Of his own will, God brought us forth by the word of truth. God is leading us. Right? God is drawing us forth. Now, there are a lot, there's some debates here between the Armenians and the Reformed views, but the point is that God is leading us, and he is the one who makes it possible. Um, I don't remember what I, who, where I got this, but it says, that is, God took counsel with himself and resolved that he would not leave sinners in their plight. He decided to grant them spiritual life by the word of truth. This rebirth keeps sin from giving birth to death, and it makes God's children the first fruits of his creation, as we read about verse 19, which we'll talk about next week. But there's some other things about God's generosity, too, about living it out. God makes it possible for us to live it out. So often we're told, okay, there are all these rules, and if you can follow all these rules perfectly, you'll please God. Well, what do we know from Scripture? Even Jesus says it, you can't. In your own, you cannot follow all the rules. Paul says, I knew the rules, and I, that's what taught me that I couldn't keep them, because I tried, and I failed. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, 23-25, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. So not of the flesh, but of the spirit, through the living and enduring word of God. And this word is the good news that we preach to you. So through the gospel, the truth was communicated, Jesus was accepted, and life came. And through the preaching of the gospel in Christ, God draws people to himself. You can see that in John uh, 1 13, 1 Corinthians 4 15. You know, one author writes, as the gospel wins the hearts of sinners, they freely choose the new life that he already willed for them. God wants us to be alive. Think of John 3 15. 3, 15, 16, 17, actually. Because our life rests on God's unchanging goodness, not on our own changeable choices, that life is secure in Christ. This is a great gift. This is an eternal gift. That's in that second category of gifts that come over time. His love and His care for us are serious. He's willing to pay prices that are astronomical. 
We don't want to send our kids to die for somebody else, but he did. He's bringing good out of our lives, even when there's only been a train wreck. Even though it seems impossible, God has worked. And you've seen it. Maybe you've seen it in your own life. Maybe you've seen it in others' lives. I've seen people who had addictions who just ended one day when they came to know Jesus as Savior and turned it over. I've known anger, brutal anger, and and bitterness and lives change in so many ways when God actually enters in instead of us trying to play God and trying to win over his favor by following the rules or by wallowing in our own failures going, I could never do it on my own. God never designed us to be alone. He never designed us to rely upon ourselves alone. We're not made for that. We don't have the capacity for that no matter how delusional we may be. It's still not true. We have responsibility, yes. We have decisions to make, yes. But God is the one who does the heavy lifting. You know, God cares always. There will be a time of judgment. We have this life to live out and to make choices. But he's cared for us. He made a way for us before time began, before the earth was created. And he has made sure those things have happened. And he's caring for us now. Those who reject him, he still cares for and is drawing them. Those who have accepted him, he's still drawing and transforming them. Because he's faithful. He's reliable. We can count on him. The Bible gives us evidence of that. And those trials in our own lives, when we have weathered them, when we look back and go, you know, God was in that, are another reminder of his faithfulness, his truth, year after year, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he is there even when we don't want to believe it. He was there even when Israel rejected it. And the few who listened and followed walked into the promised land. The lesson for us is this. God is always there. He's reliable. His loving goodness is available. Don't buy into the lies of the enemy that God will never accept you. It's not true. Don't buy into the lies of the enemy and say you've got to get yourself cleaned up before you can come to Jesus. It's impossible. You're not God. It takes God to do that. And God loves you even when you fail. Even when you make poor choices. Even when you don't know where to turn next. He's there to help us know Him and grow in love and grace and mercy just like Him. The challenge is not to fear. We're good at being afraid. What will people say? What will happen if? What if I don't? Right? Fill in those blanks. You've got those blanks in life, right? We've got those blanks with our own issues. We've got those blanks with our spouse, with our friends, or our lack thereof, or our kids, or our lack thereof. I mean, whatever it is, there are plenty of opportunities to fear. But listen to some of these reminders from Scripture. Isaiah 41.10, where God says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In Psalm 46, 1 through 3, God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, we will not fear. We have a choice. Fear actually is a choice. Now, initially, we may be surprised when something happens and we can be fearful. But as we go along, that choice comes in again. Am I focused on my inability or am I focused on God's ability? Am I focused on my unreliability or on God's reliability? Who is faithful? Who is true? Who is strong? And then Jesus himself says in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus is the source of peace. As followers of Christ, we can take comfort in knowing that no matter what struggles we may encounter, and we will encounter them, we have victory through Christ who has overcome the world. He has lived a life. He has been challenged in many ways far worse than we've ever been challenged and has made it fully man, fully God. He has walked through this world. So let us lift our heads high, knowing that God is with us every step of the way with his strength and his guidance available. We can face whatever challenges come our way. 
confident that he will carry us through to victory, that he will be there to the very end, that he will not leave us nor forsake us. God is faithful. He has overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and care. Great are you and worthy and true. And we are fearful, and we are afraid, and we are broken. And you love us. You love us when we're rebels. You love us when we come to know you. And you heap good gifts upon us. Even though those good gifts sometimes come with trials in the process of receiving. May we grow in our trust of you, our faith of your works, of your reliability. Father, we just need you. May you work mightily in every life here we go. And we thank you for your love and care in Jesus. Amen. This world is not known for its faithfulness, but our God is. It can make all the difference in hope, in health, in healing, and in a future that matters. If you have questions, comments, concerns, prayer requests, reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, we're praying for you. Will you pray for us? God bless you.